So today is going to be a shorter lesson. I'm not going to go too in-depth into uh, subnetting. It's one of those things that I think that if you ever need to do it, I think you're better off to just look up the rules and look up everything beforehand as opposed to trying to memorize it. Because um, let's be honest, you know, how many more years do you guys have before you go off on the job market? One, two, three years? Somewhere in there? Are you going to memorize subnetting rules in a year? Who thinks they would? Just going to be honest, you probably won't. So the sort of thing I recommend that if you're going out for a networking interview, just kind of glance over the rules, make sure you understand it. But for this class, um, I certainly won't ask a lot of test questions over it. Um, if I do, it'll be a very easy question. And I'll probably, instead of asking you know, the specifics on how you would do it, probably just ask what it is. Is that fair? So like I said, we're going to go over it a little bit, but just don't worry about it too much. Um, many things we're covering today, subnetting, a little bit of stuff on troubleshooting IP addressing, as well as uh, network address translation. So kind of looking over the chapter, uh, I really think this chapter could be combined with chapter 7. Because talking about what a subnet is, is pretty relevant to talking about IP addresses as a whole, especially IPv4. Uh, so that's something I think could be incorporated, but they chose not to, and that's, that's fine, you know. It's just a separate chapter. So like I said, this is going to be a little bit quicker than normal. I don't think anyone's going to complain about that. Luckily for you all, this stack of exams isn't for you. So. I think our exam is, uh, what is our exam in here? Do anyone know? Goodness, you guys got that memorized. Yeah, October 11th, that's right. So it's going to be a Monday. Um, probably should have said this sooner, but no class on Friday. Uh, Fort Lewis has some sort of a, I don't know exactly what it's called, like October mini break or something. I don't know. Anyone got any cool plans? Exams, hopefully not for here. Um, I hope I get to make it up to Silverton. Uh, Paul's talking about going to Silverton. I think that'd be a good trip. We'll see if it works out. But anyway, not related to this class. What is related to this class is a subnet. So the process of subnetting is really about creating smaller networks that are still um, you know, able to sort of share the common networking components. So you can have one router, you can have multiple subnets. Um, one switch can have multiple subnets. Now, can a hub have multiple subnets? Trick question. A hub's a dumb device. Does not uh, recognize even which device to send the packet to. Do you think it can recognize a subnet? I would think that'd be pretty difficult. So the reason that we subnet, uh, the main reason is to reduce traffic over a network. And I'll kind of disagree with the book a little bit when they say that's the main reason, because it's not really reducing the amount of traffic in a way. It's instead, because you still have the same amount overall being exchanged out of the network. It's really for inter-network communication that reduces traffic. Um, so if you think about it, if you send off a SIN acknowledge and it goes to everywhere. This is one example of something you could do. Uh, or you send off an ARP request. Because it's going to go to everywhere. Okay. So if you have a subnet that has, say, half the host on it as a regular network, so this is a regular network. Let's say we've got two separate subnets here. Uh, probably shouldn't draw like that. Let's use squares. Okay, two separate uh, subnets. Then basically, as opposed to sending it to everywhere, send it to half as many places. And on a large scale, you know, particularly getting into the thousands of hosts, uh, you're going to see that's going to make a pretty substantial difference. So by reducing that internal network communication uh, that's going to go across the network, what you're really doing is you're making better network performance. Now, uh, it's purely derived from that reduction, okay, because you're having less congestion. So if you're sending requests off to half as many hosts, you, you guys get the point there. It's like Sending it to half as many places, it's not having to go as many places. Uh, it's waiting for fewer responses. It's just going to run better overall. Um, and then probably another big reason, simplified management. Um, it's a lot easier to track down a problem on a smaller subnet than a larger subnet. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If you're trying to diagnose some random network connectivity <coughs> problem, doesn't matter what the problem is, it's almost always going to be easier with subnets. Uh, what if the problem is the subnets? That's going to be pretty hard to diagnose then, wouldn't it? So 
keep in mind there's always caveats to everything. So kind of go through the rules of creating subnets. Well, these aren't even really rules. Consider more guidelines. First thing you want to do is figure out how many network IDs you need to have. And the way you do this is you figure out for every uh, subnet you want to have. So if you want to have five subnets, it's going to be five plus one for every WAN. So if you have two WANs, for example, add those together, what's the total? Five plus seven. Not a trick question. So the answer is seven. You know, because you add five and seven, you've got to have seven network IDs. Does that make sense? Okay. Determine the number of required hosts. So obviously, you got to make sure that you have uh, one for each of the different uh, TCP IP hosts. So there's a trick question. Say you got a person who wants to communicate over wired and wireless. Okay, so ignoring the fact that's going to cause a loop in the network, uh, how many hosts would they need for that one device? So there's going to be two hosts. Does that make sense? Two separate connections. Now, like I said, it would create a loop. We'll talk about loop in a later chapter. Um, don't worry about it for now. And I wouldn't necessarily be too worried about it because, you know, pretty much any equipment from the past, I'd say five to ten years, it's going to be able to sort of mitigate a lot of the problems associated with loops. And in addition to having one for each TCP IP host, obviously you have to have one for each router. So if you have, let's say, 20 routers on a network, add 20. I think that makes a lot of sense. Shouldn't be too many confusion there. And then what you're going to do is, once you've kind of gathered up all the information about what the network needs to have, just make one subnet mask for the whole network, and then you're just going to make different subnet IDs for the physical segments, as well as for each subnet. Does that make sense? Like I said, we're not going to do too much about this, but what we will do is kind of go over uh, the basics. So, of course, the default subnet mask uh, is kind of going to be in the format where it's 255, that's going to describe the network. If it's zero for the default subnet mask, that's describing the host machines. So, for example, if we were doing a class A network, you know, it's going to start with 10 dot something, assuming it's private, which it is in this case. And then for the other uh, parts of the subnet, we know that we can have all of these, all of these, and all of these to distinguish hosts. And then if we're doing class C down here, we know that it's only the last octet that can distinguish hosts. Does that make sense? So like I said, I don't know why this wasn't included in the last chapter, but hey, whatever, you know. I'm not going to sweat it too much. Just understand that 255 refers to the network, 0 refers to the host, if we're talking about a default mask. Now, do they always look like this? Is every subnet going to look like one of these three? Who says yes? Who says no? So they're not always going to look like this is the default, but as we'll see here, um, we can see other subnets. And you know, the subnet mask, the default will always look like that, but in terms of what we're actually using, it may or may not. Uh, if we have multiple subnets, uh, we will see different subnet masks. So let's talk a little bit about CIDR. Um, who likes CIDR in here? Any CIDR fans? Well, this is not talking about the drink. It's talking about classless interdomain routing. And uh, basically, what you need to know about this is you have an ISP. The ISP has some way to sort of uh, give out addresses to customers. And basically, what this process is, it is all about, you know, sort of giving the customer the addresses and saying you can use these addresses. So if you hear about a problem with CIDR, that's what it's referring to in the context of networking. If you hear about a problem with CIDR in the context of a drink, it could be referring to other things. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. So like I said, we're not going to go through subnets too much. The book does a really good job if you're interested, but this is probably more than I would even put on the exam. I just don't think it's a concept that is really that important to memorize. I think it's one of those things you're planning out a network. You only do that a couple times in your career. You know, it's pretty unlikely that you get a job at an MSP and you know, let's say you basically create corporate networks all day. If that's possible, then guess what? You'll need to know this a lot more, but that's the sort of thing that you'll cross that bridge when you get there. So, I'm just going to go through this a little bit. I got an example network address here. What type of network address is this? 
192.168.10.0. Is it class A, B, or C? C, exactly right. Okay, so with the uh, with that in mind, we can only really play with the last octet. Okay, everything else we can't really play with for determining host. So, if the subnet mask is 255.255.255.128, how many subnets are there? Two is exactly correct. We have subnet, uh, we'd have zero, and we have 128. Okay, so think of this like you have your first host, it's going to be one plus the subnet mask. You can't have the subnet mask be a host. Does that make sense? Why can't the subnet mask be a host? Yeah, exactly. So it's defining the network. You can't really have two things at the same address. Well, you can, but it would cause problems. Uh, you could certainly have duplicate addresses, and it's something that you may face. Now, let's say you did have a network that had duplicate IP addresses. What does that usually mean? Where would you anticipate the problem for that being? Starts with a D. Not DNS. What is it? DHCP. Uh, that's something that will happen from time to time. You'll get an error message saying duplicate IP addresses. Something weird is going on with the DHCP server. Um, if I were a betting man, I'd bet it's a problem with the leases. Okay. But I'm not going to bet on that because it could be a lot of different things. Okay, so some other things to go over. Uh, first host, like I said, is going to be one plus subnet mask. Last host is going to be uh, basically one or two minus the next subnet mask. Does that make sense? Because your broadcast address, like if you're sending something out to all the devices on the subnet, um, like an ARP request, for example, then you would use, in this case, if you're on subnet zero, 255, or no, not 255. You'd use 127 for the last bit of it. And then for the subnet 128, use 255. So basically the two reservations are going to be subnet ID itself as well as the broadcast address. Um, so like I say, how many total hosts can we have here? We can go 1 to two, uh, 126. How many total hosts? Hundred twenty six, right? Anyone disagree? I'm pretty sure the answer is hundred twenty six. And we do that for both of them. So again, like I said, I'm not gonna ask too much about this on the exam. Just make sure you understand the process and why we submit. Okay, speaking of troubleshooting, um, let's say you have a device that you're trying to send something to and you're not able to establish a connection. Something you may be faced with in the uh, in your future career. And, you know, there's a couple of different steps you may take. So I want to first say these are not the only steps you may take, and these are not the uh, necessarily the right steps. These are just uh, sort of standardized steps. Does that make sense? Well, this is a textbook way to troubleshoot. Does that mean that's how you should go out and troubleshoot? Absolutely not. Uh, there's no limitations on what you can or cannot do. Well, there are, but I'm not going to give them to you in terms of, like, you know, that's for your employer to say. Um, I'm not your employer, so... I'm not going to put any limitations on how you troubleshoot a problem. So they first suggested you ping localhost. What is the localhost address? Starts with a 1. Who remembers that from last class? Patrick, do you know it? Localhost? Who knows it? So this will definitely be on the exam. Localhost address always going to be 127.0.0.1. Okay, uh, that's a guaranteed exam question. Well, I'll say 90% exam question. And basically what that's going to tell you is if your local host has a TCP IP stack that is somewhat functional. Okay, let's say it's not functional and you are in a corporate environment and let's say it's a Windows computer. It's the easiest way to fix it. What is the easiest way to fix a non-functional TCP IP stack on a Windows computer in a corporate environment? Okay, 
I would make an argument the easiest way is just gonna be re-imaging. Okay? That's assuming that you're whatever firm you're at, assuming they have half decent backup policies and you know they're not having local file storage, just re-image the machine. Okay, it'll be in and out within probably less than 30 minutes in most cases. That's gonna be a lot quicker than trying to figure out, you know, how to install and you know reinstall all that sort of stuff. So much easier just to wipe and you know reinstall a machine. Is that not fair? I think that's pretty fair. Fixes almost everything. You know, you might spend four or five hours tracking down the problem. Okay. Would you rather spend four or five hours, or would you rather spend thirty minutes? Who votes for four or five hours? Who votes for thirty minutes? Okay. That's the more logical approach. Um, just being realistic, you know. Certain uh, people may want you to track down every problem. I say fix the problem, unless it's a, you know, sort of a widespread problem. Then you might want to track it down and, you know, figure out if you could fix it all in one swoop. But, you know, single standalone problem, why on earth would you spend four or five hours? I don't have that answer. Because it's not logical. Okay, let's say that you do get a local host uh, ping response. In fact, if you guys are on a computer right now, go ahead and uh, open up command prompt or terminal if you're on a non-Windows computer, just type in ping 127.0.0.1. Okay? Anyone not get a response? That'd be kind of strange if you did not receive a response. Should receive a response very quickly. Okay? Uh, if it's greater than one millisecond, I'd be pretty surprised. Um, so anyway, like I say, if you have a TCP IC stack, which you should, then you shouldn't have this problem. Okay, next ping your local host IP address. And that's going to be your private IP address. So if you're on a uh, pretty much any computer in here, I guess, even if it's personal, should be a class A address, should be 10 dot something. Okay, then you would ping that. And I don't know whether or not that will be uh, blocked. It could theoretically be. And that's gonna tell you if your network interface card is functioning, okay? So if you don't get a response from your local address, because you're not leaving the machine, you're going out to the NIC, the NIC recognizes it's on port, or not port, it's on uh, IP address, and it's not gonna leave the NIC. So let's say that you're not able to get a response on this, then what do you do? If you don't get a ping on your local host IP address, not your local host address, localhost IP address, what would you do? How about try a different NIC, you know? Use a USB Wi-Fi adapter. Use a USB uh, Ethernet adapter. Yeah. Just use some other NIC that's not the current one that's built into the system. And what if that works and your current one does not? It could be a couple things. Could be a driver issue. Um, if you're on a non-Windows operating system, it could be some sort of a kernel extension problem. Um, could be a lot of different things. You know, you could certainly try to just replace the internal NIC. Now, you may have some issues with that. Let's say you're on a device that does uh, whitelisting, okay? Then what do you do? Can you just plop any old NIC into it? For example, a lot of modern Lenovo ThinkPads use whitelisting for their uh, wireless network interface cards. Even though you can physically change the uh, wireless network interface card, will it work if you don't use the proper one? Um, no, it would not. So in that case, um, you'd either get an appropriate card that is on the whitelist, um, which you'd have to look that up, of course, or just get one of those small little USB adapters. You know, they're pretty small. A lot of times people don't even notice them. Um, so, you know, you've got options, okay? Does that make sense? If you're not able to ping your local uh, IP address. Now, the real question is, would you even have a non-APIPA address if your NIC wasn't functioning? I don't think you really would. I don't think this is really a useful step. But it's in the book, so we'll talk about it. Does anyone disagree with that? Does anyone think you can get a private IP address from the router that's not APIPA, which APIPA wouldn't come from the router? Or DHCP, I should say. And, you know, you would be able to receive it and yet not use it. Does that make any sense at all? I think the only case you can make an argument is that if the network interface card were having 
an issue after it received the address, but before the lease on that address expired. Uh, I guess that could happen. I don't think it's very common, but why not? You know, just throw it on there as a troubleshooting step. Okay, then you want to ping the default router, or the gateway rather, which is going to be the router. Okay, and that's going to tell you if you're able to establish a connection with the router. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If you're unable to establish it, do further troubleshooting to figure out why. Um, could be a problem with a physical connection. Uh, could be a lot of different problems. Could be a problem with the router. You know, lots of different things. And then finally, you know, the whole purpose of this troubleshooting was if we had a machine we weren't able to ping or reach or do any connection with, uh, ping that address. Okay, and that's going to give you a pretty good idea. If both of you can ping the other one, what does that probably imply? Is it likely a network problem if you're able to establish a ping connection? It's unlikely. Could it still be? Absolutely. What if it's a problem with a firewall? And, you know, ping's going over ICMP. What if whatever protocol you're using, let's say it's going over FTP or SFTP. Could it just be the firewalls dropping all of those uh, ports? It absolutely could be. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily establish immediately it's a software problem or rule out that it's a network problem, but it gives you something to go off of. That makes sense? Any questions about basic troubleshooting? And like I said, it's not an exhaustive list by any stretch. It's just sort of a textbook way. Um, and it's pretty similar to what I would recommend. Like I said, I wouldn't really spend a lot of time pinging a local host IP address. I do see it could potentially have some value. It's just going to be highly limited in function. Okay. So speaking of that, go over some basic functions here um, that you may use. Like I said, if you're on Windows, it'll be slightly different than on pretty much any other platform. Uh, of course, you have ping. That's going to be the same on everything. Uh, ping, of course, using ICMP, telling you if you're able to um, establish a connection. Uh, trace route's going to tell you the specific connection you're establishing. Uh, trace RT on Windows. The Windows likes to be a little bit different. That's okay. Um, ARP slash A, what do you think that does? So what is ARP? It's address resolution protocol, right? So it's going to give you the MAC address of a given IP address. Okay, then you have IF config. That's going to be on, like I say, everything but Windows. On Windows, they change it to IP config. Um, let's make sure you understand that. So, who's not using Windows in here? Anyone? No Linux or Mac users? Well, not a single person. That's surprising. On the machines in the lab, every single one of them are running uh, a Linux distro. So, you would not use IP config. Don't believe me? Try it. Uh, it's not going to work. You have to use IF config. Same thing with a Mac. So make sure you understand that. But they do basically the same thing. Um, give you information about the network. So like I said, I recommend you try it if you haven't already. Last thing we're going to cover today is about network address translation. And you know we talked about this some last class. Going to go just a little bit more in detail about it. But the primary purpose of it, at least in modern time, is to share a public IP address. So we talked about there's a limited number of public IP addresses. Uh, 4.3 billion IP addresses in total, well, for IPv4, point back up. 4.3 billion in total, you know, I'd say under 4 billion of those are going to be public. Uh, so if there's under 4 billion that are public, a lot of them are going to go to you know, research agencies, um, DOD, that sort of stuff. Huge number of them. Okay. So in terms of the ones that end consumers are able to get, it's a very limited pool. So ISPs have to sort of provision those accordingly. And one of the ways to do that is network address translation. And the main reason that we use, like I said, share public IP addresses, but also let's say that you wanted to change to an ISP and they had a different uh, public address scheme. And had a different private address scheme they required. They can certainly do that. We just talked about that with CIDR. Um, what you could do is you can use NAT to sort of get around that, keep using exactly what you're using, and that's going to save you a whole lot of time in reconfiguration. Okay, 
the last reason you would use the network address translation is to merge two existing uh, intranets with the same address scheme. So, you know, the bookies example, let's say two frames merged, they're both using, I don't know, 10, so you're both using class A's. That's a horrible sound, isn't it? Okay, so they're both using class A's. What do we know about that? Okay, well we know that there's gonna be the possibility to repeat because default mask is gonna look like this, 255.0.0.0. Okay, that means we can only change 10. And if we look at the class A definition, what is the only uh, first octet for a class A private address? 10, that's exactly correct. So obviously, you'd have to use some sort of way to get around that. Uh, eventually, maybe you would have a single sort of network, uh, not rules, I don't want to say rules. Um, you know, I think rules are for fools. <laughs> I didn't go there. Anyway, um, so don't think of it as rules, but think of it as having a single uh, network management. So you could theoretically do that. Um, however, network address translation is going to be a nice stopgap to allow the networks to communicate with each other, yet have duplicate addresses. Does that make sense? Duplicate private addresses. It also, of course, allows them to share public addresses. So, go through the advantages and disadvantages here. Copy this straight out of the book. Um, so, like I say, obviously, you know, having uh, one public address for maybe even an entire network. You know, you have thousands of devices use one public IP address. Uh, that's possible. Um, reduces address overlap occurrences. I don't know that I'd agree with that. I think it actually increases them but it reduces the problems associated with them. Because of network address translation, one of the main reasons you would use it is to allow you to have duplicate addresses. So is it fair to say that it reduces the occurrence of duplicate addresses? I don't think that's fair at all. I think what it does is it mitigates the problems associated with having duplicate addresses. Does that make sense? So I would probably disagree with the book right here. A little bit uh, you know, semantic, whatever you want to call it, but it's important to understand that, okay? Uh, increases flexibility when connected to the internet. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. And then eliminates address renumbering as network change. And that could be a very big advantage. So disadvantages, not really that severe in my opinion. Um, you know, the main thing is is that it's going to add a little bit of overlap. But we're talking, you know, fractions of a millisecond. Okay, not really a whole lot of things you would notice as an end user. So. And obviously, this is assuming you have a somewhat robust network. If you're using 20-year-old equipment, this would be a bigger concern. Does that make sense? Modern equipment is going to have plenty of uh, capacity to be able to handle anything like this, assuming you're not, you know, having billions of devices on like a one gigabit per second backlink, something crazy like that. Um, one sort of disadvantage is you don't have as much end-to-end -end traceability because if you're using the same address, I would also argue that's also an advantage, though. Uh, because if you have a device that has a public IP address, what are people going to do to that public IP address? Okay, it's going to be attacked 24/7. It's going to be attacked, you know, multiple times a second, and you know, it's going to run all sorts of attacks on it. We'll cover information security next uh, semester. You guys taking the information security class? We'll definitely cover some of that next semester. Just understand that there are certainly going to be uh, lots of foreign domains that are going to attack any open port, any public IP address. So I wouldn't even call this necessarily a pure disadvantage. It's both a disadvantage and an advantage. Does that make sense? So yeah, it does in fact not provide traceability, but that's also a good thing. It's not like the best thing ever. Obviously, you, know, you want to have multiple layers to your security, but it's certainly a layer of that security. And then lastly, um, this is what a lot of end users may realize, a lot of applications don't like uh, uh, sort of networks that are heavily using that. So I'm not talking about you know just sharing it across five devices. You have a network like a, let's say, a big university. There's easily over 100,000 devices on any university network, okay? Uh, it can make it more difficult to get packets to a specific place if it's using something like UDP. Um, now, again, I don't consider that to be a huge disadvantage for a corporate network, um, but for a private network, it could be. 
So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and this is really common with things like uh, console gaming. Uh, I don't think Steam has any problems with this, but if you're on a console, maybe it doesn't recognize NAC connections as well as it should. That's one of the common examples of having uh, problems with it where certain applications would not function. Uh, any questions about NAT so far? You guys kind of understand what it is? So three different types of NAT, okay? The first one uh, is you know, kind of where you have one-to-one. -one. So you have one public IP address is shared with one private IP address. It's not really the most useful thing, now is it? Because if the whole purpose, of, if a main purpose of NAT is to have fewer public IP addresses for a greater number of uh, private, is this that useful? Uh, the only time you would use it is if your goal was to do something like uh, not having to reconfigure a network. Okay, then you also have dynamic NAT, where static, of course, like a static IP address, it's not going to change. Okay, dynamic IP, you still have a one-to-one -one relationship. However, um, the public IP address, you have some pool that's going to be assigned from. So you may have a thousand devices or a thousand hosts. Okay, and you may have 500 public IP addresses. And if those thousand hosts aren't all using the connection at the same time, let's say some of them are like a laptop, some are like a desktop, you know, maybe you have your desktop off when you're at home, whatever, or have it off when you're not at home, I mean, and have your laptop, you get the idea. Okay, so you still have a one-to-one -one relationship, though. If a host is on and actively using the network, it's going to have a public IP. It just won't be the same public IP every time. Does that make sense? So, um, pretty straightforward there. And then finally, what you're most likely to see is overloading, where you have one public IP address for many different private IP addresses or hosts. So, like I said, just make sure you understand these different terms down here. Got inside local. Uh, that's going to be where you're looking at the Inside source address before translation, outside local is a destination host uh, before translation. Inside global is going to be uh, inside host after translation, and outside global is going to be name of the outside destination host after the translation. Just make sure you understand those. Um, I'm probably not going to ask a test question about these. I probably would ask a test question about these, though. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's just what a basic overloading NAT example looks like. You can see you have your different inside hosts over here. They're all sharing a public address, source address. Okay, they're connecting to the internet. You got these guys over here, got the destination addresses, and you can tell, are they the same address or are they different addresses? It's all the same address. Okay, so that's why the routers over here is basically handling all the network address translation. And like I said, you've got your NAT table down here. Of course, it's all using P uh, TCP. Pretty straightforward. Protocol is going to be coming from the router. Uh, you got your inside, all that stuff. So, like I say, uh, that's basically what we're doing here. Just think of it as sharing a uh, public IP address, but obviously you're not sharing private IP addresses in this example. So each of these hosts have different private IP addresses. All right. Just kind of wrap everything up. We talked about subnetting, talked about uh, troubleshooting IP addressing. We also talked about network address translation. Any questions? All right, have a great weekend, everyone. I will see you all on Monday. Don't forget the no class on Friday.